Hi everyone and welcome to uh, today's uh, panel on criminology and forensics uh, and this is hosted by the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Before I begin today I would like to uh, acknowledge do an, an, an acknowledgement of country uh, so I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Yora Nation upon whose ancestral lands our city campus now stands. I pay respect to the elders both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land and as people of great ingenuity and innovation. Now, before we get into uh, the seminar today, I would just like to cover some housekeeping. So uh, if you do have any questions for any of our speakers during today's session, uh, you can please put them in the question and answer box um, down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this webinar is being recorded uh, and will be available to view at a later date, but bear in mind that it is only uh, the presenters uh, cameras that are being recorded. Um, none of your audio or visual is recorded at this time. Uh, if you do have any questions about anything that is presented in today's um, session, you can contact us at fas.international at uts.edu.au. All right, so we're going to get in very quickly, but I'd just like to briefly introduce you to uh, the speakers that we will be uh, having today. So uh, my name is Dr. Scott Chadwick, and I am the Director of Undergraduate Programs for the Faculty of Science, uh, and I am a forensic scientist um, by trade. And I'll be moderating uh, today's session, uh, but we will be hearing from uh, some amazing uh, academics and researchers in the area of both forensic science and criminology, uh, and they are Professor Claude Rue, Dr. Alan Beckley, and Dr. Marie Morilado. Uh, and in order to, to get, let's get straight into it, uh, and we're going to start off with uh, Professor Claude Rue. Uh, now, Professor Claude Rue is the um, director of the UTS Centre for Forensic Science, uh, and he has been pivotal in the development of forensic science uh, in Australia. And for over the past 25 years, he has worked in developing and leading Australia's first undergraduate and PhD program in forensic science. His research activities cover a broad spectrum of forensic science, including forensic intelligence and the contribution of forensic science to policing and security. So uh, thank you, Claude, and I'll let you get started. Thank you, Scott, and, and welcome, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to um, give me a bit of information about uh, forensic science and criminology. Uh, it's interesting to know uh, that criminology and forensic science share the same object of study, and by that we mean crime and deviant behaviour. The interesting thing is when we consider behaviour and activities, um, you know, by, by doing that, we leave traces. Uh, I'm sure nowadays, especially during a lockdown period, we leave a lot of digital traces, you know, of our identity and our activities through our, you know, computer or our digital devices. But in, in, you know, normal physical life, we also leave traces of all sorts of, of nature. And forensic science will focus on, on these traces, these objective traces. Uh, and uh, forensic science will try to um, uh, examine these traces and infer a lot of information from that, these traces, um, and in priority using the enabling disciplines of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, criminology will focus on the social science approach, including using law, psychology, sociology, design, etc. Now, the interesting thing, you can see it's two different perspectives of the same problem. Uh, the nexus between these two disciplines is growing uh, because uh, when we are the nexus, we can analyze the, uh, a significant social problem and complex problem uh, in a holistic manner. Um, now, historically, it's very interesting because more than 100 years ago, forensic science and criminology were almost part of the same discipline. Uh, both of them were largely derived from medicine and social sciences. Some people even said that they, they are born twins. Now, if we look at the forefathers of forensic science, uh, people like Hans Gross, um, um, uh, magistrates in the inquisitorial system, 
uh, very interested in crime scenes. Uh, Edmond Locard, very famous for Locard's exchange principle, who uh, opened the first uh, forensic science laboratory in Lyon in France in, in um, 1910, uh, or Rice, who uh, developed the first academic school of, of, and program of forensic science at the University of Lausanne in 1909. Um, they all shared a, a very um, common feature. They are all very interested, or they were all very interested in understanding criminality. And it's interesting to uh, tell this anecdote about Rice and Locker uh, visiting each other in Lyon. Uh, and, and, you know, they would go in the underworld precinct in Lyon to observe what's going on, uh, you know, in this sort of underworld. Um, then later, almost at the same time, but shortly later in, in the US, we, you have someone like Volmer at the Berkeley University. He was a police, magist a police administrator first, uh, a criminologist, and he developed this concept of scientific policemen. So you see, you've got this sort of um, you know, amalgamation of these two fields, which are seen slightly different for most people, but actually there is a, a large commonality. Um, forensic science and criminology um, gradually moved away from each other uh, during the 1900, mainly because of technological development in forensic science. Now, the interesting thing is they reconverge over the last decade or so, especially through the development of forensic intelligence. Uh, and, and Dr. Moralaito will tell more about that. Now, let's go back to these famous traces. These traces are really interest, interesting, and, 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 and Mary will talk a bit more about that as well. Um, but traces are collected because they are supposed to be connected with entities of interest, and because they have a potential utility in explaining the activity they originated from. Now, interestingly, each discipline interested in these sort of activities meets forensic science at this point, because law uh, because this activity may mean an offence. Criminology, because the deciphered mechanisms can inform on disorders, deviant behaviour, or more broadly on crime, and, and develop some strategies uh, to prevent or disrupt this, this sort of uh, crime or deviant behaviour. So, you know, I hope I generated some interest showing you that actually it's two different perspectives uh, of the same problem. And really, I agree with the people who said that forensic science and criminology are born twins. Now, the interesting thing with, uh, um, with a double degree, such as the one we're talking today, is that it enables um, you know, future proofing for jobs. Uh, because people with both skill set of forensic science and criminology are very well equipped to actually um, you know, be ready for jobs that do not exist yet, or even maybe, uh, you know, even themselves develop or propose the, you know, new jobs of the future. Um, so in the next slide, please. So in the next slide, it's just to show you how in forensic science we are interested in these traces uh, that have been left by activity and presence. And that provides a lot of information um, about, uh, you know, the modus operandi of, of what could have happened, um, a lot of information about spatial temporal information, and it's possible to compare, uh, to compare um, cases and compare traces and hence get some kind of profiling, but from the forensic science angle. Now, if you go on the right-hand side of the slide, you see a more common profiling for people who are interested in, in more social sciences. Um, but actually, the, both together can be very, very powerful. And it's what I was trying to, uh, to tell you, um, you know, during these few minutes. So thank you very much. Great, excellent. Thank you so much, Claude. Uh, yeah, I think, it, I think it's very interesting that uh, we may think that science and criminology don't uh, necessarily overlap. Um, but we can see that from the very beginning that these two areas have always been um, from the same from the same discipline. So thank you, Claude. Uh, I'd like now like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Alan Beckley. Uh, so Dr. Alan Beckley was a police officer for over thirty years in the United Kingdom, working in various roles uh, 
from the ranks of constable to superintendent. Uh, he first worked at the New South Wales Police Academy in Goulburn, teaching police recruits, and then moved to the Australian Graduate School of Policing in Manly and worked as a senior lecturer at Charles Sturt University. He is currently a curriculum advisor at the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, in the international studies and education sector within the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. So uh, thank you, Alan. Right, thanks very much, Scott. Um, that was um, a very good introduction to me from uh, you, uh, what, uh, what Claude was talking about. Um, but I'm gonna talk about um, uh, criminology from a policing perspective. Um, it's a very exciting time for criminology because of the changes and challenges and the crises in criminology at the present time. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about that um, as, as I go through. Um, but um, it's interesting that Claude mentioned the history um, of criminology and, um, and forensic science because they sort of interact really with policing. Um, policing uh, started probably about 150 years ago. Most uh, democratic countries uh, uh, started uh, to appoint police forces around that time in the mid to uh, mid sort of um, 19th century. But then um, the history of policing sort of lapses for about 150 years. Nothing actually happens in policing or very little. Um, and then we move very swiftly on to uh, the, the 20th century and 21st century. So um, round about um, the 1990s, we start thinking, well, um, crime is overtaking us. Um, in terms of its uh, number and its complexity and its violence. So the police need to do something about it. And they decided to uh, introduce what's, what's now being called intelligence-led policing. They suddenly realized uh, something that they knew, um, every, every experienced police officer knew, that about 60% of all crime is committed by 6% of the population. In other words, if you were able to concentrate on that 6% of the population, you'd certainly be solving quite a lot of the crime. So that's what, what, what uh, intelligence-led policing um, uh, started to uh, introduce. And it happened in the UK, in, um, in Kent, in about 1990, and it spread sort of all, all around the world. And um, it's basically analysis driven and it's intelligence based and you'll hear more about intelligence as, as, as this seminar um, progresses. And um, it's all around the police being proactive and trying to solve crimes by the use of um, intelligence and forensic science, uh, which was started to introduce by um, Claude there and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a moment. Um, uh, but the police suddenly realized that they couldn't do everything, that, you know, that they were the experts in, in crime, but they didn't know everything about crime, and they also needed to work with other organizations to actually solve crime and reduce it to an acceptable level in society. Um, there was a bit of a love-hate relationship between the police and academics and researchers uh, at that time, which, which nowadays is sort of almost um, reduced to nothing because the police uh, work with researchers and universities all the time now. Um, and that led on to a thing called evidence-based policing, which really means uh, looking at policing techniques and only using techniques that are tried and tested. In other words, they're properly evaluated and assessed. And if they work, then they're promulgated around um, the world and also used by many different police forces. So they're proactive, they're tailored and focused and place oriented. So that is another term that you'll hear during the study of criminology is evidence-based policing. Um, <clears throat> and also I'd like to talk about um, the impacts of technology on policing. 
Um, if you can um, cast your minds back, maybe you can't, um, before mobile phones came into being, uh, most of you probably won't, won't remember that, but if you look at the slide, you'll see um, a police box, and you might recognize it, which is on a, 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 fa a, a favorite, favorite program of mine called Doctor Who. But um, we actually used these in the back in the 1970s, these police boxes, uh, because the only way to contact patrolling police officers was by stopping at a static, mo a, a static phone, a landline phone, and then talking to the police station because there weren't any personal radios, there weren't any mobile phones, and there was no other way of contacting a police officer. And they were walking around a beat, um, which is a sort of designated area for, a, for an individual police officer. And they would, be, they would uh, make meetings with various people, supervisors, or they would go into these police boxes to talk about that. And then, of course, personal radios came on being, um, follow, uh, following on from um, radios in a uh, police vehicles, and then um, mobile telephony. And now every, obviously everyone is aware of uh, mobile phones nowadays, and every police officer will have one, plus probably a radio as well, or a combined uh, device with mobile telephony. Um, and for, moving on from that, the police officers are using uh, body-worn cameras, to record um, incidents at, that they attend, and um, and that that can be used in evidence as well. So um, and it can also be linked with facial recognition technology, uh, more of which we'll talk about on on the on the actual course itself, um, because it, it does um, reveal certain issues, problems, and um, privacy issues as well, and also. Uh, technology has revealed new crimes such as cybercrime, scams, ransomware, all these type of things that you, you hear every day of the week, but they didn't exist 50 years ago even. So, um, <clears throat> so that's a very brief history of um, policing and you, as you can see there are a tremendous number of changes and um, that police officers need the new skills uh, to operate effectively in the current environment. And the third thing I'd like to talk about is some uh, uh, forensic science. Um, Claude mentioned some of the things, but um, fingerprinting, for example, it was first used in 1850 in France. And subsequently uh, now, as we know, almost everyone is fingerprinted. If you go out through in, in an airport, you'll have your fingerprints taken and uh, <clears throat> they'll be checked against the database. Um, but the, the first original um, fingerprints were slightly messy because they had to be taken with, on ink pads. And, uh, uh, but now we've got um, um, much better um, equipment to, to take them um, digitally. <clears throat> so you might hear more about that from Scott perhaps. Um, and then uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is DNA. DNA technology introduced in 1984 in the UK. And now, as you'll see it on, um, depicted on uh, crime scene um, television programs, and uh, it's, it looks as though it's the answer to everything, but it's not quite the answer to everything. Uh, it can be very useful to establish uh, crime scene traces. And um, it can be useful uh, because it is accepted in evidence. So, um, but there are problems with that. And there are also privacy issues in relation to um, building up vast databases of uh, DNA um, traces, and also familial matches and um, racial identification through DNA. So there are problems. There are issues which we'll, also, we'll be talking about during the course, I'm sure. So I think that's about it from me.
but um, I hope you, you will um, sign up for the course and I'm sure it will be very interesting. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, uh, Alan. And just like Doctor Who, you took us through a journey through time and space in a, in a very short matter of time. So that was, that was excellent. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'd now like to introduce our, our final speaker for uh, this evening, and that's Dr. Marie uh, Morilato. So uh, Dr. Morilato is a senior lecturer at the University of Technology, Sydney. She completed her bachelor's and master's degree in forensic science at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, her research focuses on the triangulation of data uh, that look at the illicit drug problem through many different angles, uh, including crypto market drug discussion forums, illicit drug seizures, wastewater analysis, data from government sources, and chemical analysis of used syringes. Uh, so thank you, uh, Marie. You are good to go. Thanks, Scott. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, thanks, Scott, for the introduction. Uh, in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to show you how uh, forensic science has evolved from a purely reactive and court-focused role to a more uh, proactive role. Um, so forensic science has mainly uh, positioned itself uh, as a service provider uh, to the criminal justice system. And in this role, uh, the, the, the focus is past events uh, and the aim is to solve particular cases. Um, this role is mainly reactive. However, over the years, uh, the role of forensic science uh, has expanded, and that's what Claude was mentioning in his, in his talk. And we argued that forensic science has a role to play in the security space. And in this space, uh, we're not trying to regroup events uh, coming from the same problem, recurrent uh, problem. Um, the, we, we're not, sorry, what am I saying? We're not trying to uh, focus on each case separately, but we are trying to find, uh, to regroup pro like uh, events coming from the same problem to find a general solution. So instead of looking at each case separately, uh, we adopt a multi-case approach and try to find regularities and, simil like, and repetitions. Mm -hmm. So in this framework, uh, the aim is then to disrupt or prevent a crime from occurring and maybe reduce uh, the fear of crime. So there is just a sense of uh, proactivity. So one of the policing strategy that was mentioned by uh, Alan in his talk uh, was intelligence-led policing, uh, which is a way uh, to use, analyze, and organize uh, information to detect and uh, better understand crime problems and use resources in a more proactive way. So as the trace, which is the remnant of criminal, act criminal activity, um, is one of the most basic uh, and reliable elements that stems from a criminal or even activity. It can actually be traded and analyzed uh, systematically in combination with other information uh, to detect uh, patterns in the criminal activity. So this intelligence product can then be used uh, to make recommendation to a decision maker uh, that can then act on the problem. So either for disruption or prevention. Um, so that, this is what we actually call forensic intelligence. So I'm just gonna, go, I'm just gonna give you uh, an example of some of the research that we've done uh, in the area of illicit drugs that will hopefully explain some of the concepts that I just covered. Uh, so if you could put the next slide, please. So if we look at the drug problem, uh, often what we observe is that it's a silo approach. So each organization uh, will look at this problem from a different perspective. So for instance, if we look at the law enforcement agency, um, we, we like the law enforcement agency might make seizures of illicit drugs. This seizure can be analyzed and uh, we can obtain, obtain the purity and the type of drugs that is present in these seizures. So from a law enforcement perspective, maybe the aim would be to prosecute someone who is in possession of this uh, illicit drug. Then from a laboratory perspective, uh, maybe this drug specimen could be analyzed and they could be chemically profiled. So chemical, chemical profiling means that we are looking at the impurities that are present uh, in the drug uh, to see if they come from the same origin. So if you have two seizures of drugs and you look at their uh, impurities profile, you could potentially infer that these two drug seizures come from the same source. So there might be a link between these two cases. So 
from a laboratory perspective, they might look at case-to-case -case links. Um, then we've got health organization, uh, where we are looking more from the drug user's perspective, where there's surveys of drugs, what kind of drugs do these people use? And the results could be used more in a harm minimization approach. Then that's obviously not all the type of organization that are involved in analyzing the drug problem, but it's just a few examples. So the last one would maybe come more from the digital transformation that we observe. So obviously in the legal economy, you could see that there is a trans digital transformation where more and more people use online source to obtain goods, like whether it's clothes or anything, even like food, et cetera. So in the illegal world and in illicit drugs, for instance, similar things occur. So obviously criminals will use uh, platforms that are online in order to promote and then potentially sell uh, their uh, illicit drugs. So if we, from maybe an academic from point of view, we would analyze this data. Uh, so for instance, anything that is on the dark web, on crypto markets, um, we could potentially have an understanding of what is actually sold on these platforms. Um, similar to social media and forums, we could analyze this data as well to obtain an understanding of what is actually discussed by consumers, if there is any substance that could be of interest and could be problematic in the future. So in a preventive perspective. So this, from a law enforcement perspective, could be used to disrupt this network or this market, this online market. So obviously all these data source are there, uh, but in the current uh, approach, they are actually used, um, they are not really combined with one another. So in the research that we've conducted, we try to actually combine these different source of information to obtain a better understanding of the drug problem. So here I mentioned illicit drug seizures, so we could chemically analyze them to obtain understanding if there is any links of, uh, of illicit drugs. Um, we could use online data, as I mentioned, the crypto markets, for instance, to have an understanding of the online market. Uh, we could use surveys to have an understanding of the users, what kind of drugs are they mainly using, so what kind of drugs should we focus on. Um, then use syringes content, we could potentially analyze the, the drug content of used syringes to see what is actually consumed uh, by the, cost, the consumer. Um, and then wastewater analysis is another data source that we could potentially use to have an understanding of uh, what kind of drugs are consumed in a, in a specific um, population. So you might have heard of wastewater analysis because we hear a lot about it uh, in the current times. Uh, with COVID, so there is, it's been used a lot uh, to, uh, to, to see what kind of like, uh, if there is region of interest and we can do the same uh, with uh, illicit drugs. So if we combine all these data source, we actually have a better understanding of the drug problem and we can actually use a proactive uh, approach rather than reactive approach. So that's about it for me. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Marie. Uh, I think it's, it's really interesting uh, that Marie talks a lot about um, broadening and, and looking at things at a different perspective. And, and I think that that's what a uh, degree in the criminology and forensic science, it, it will allow graduates an opportunity to look things from, uh, not just from a single perspective, but a more holistic um, perspective. So uh, we're now gonna open up the, um, the panel to have a question and answer session. So I can see that there are some already some questions in the uh, question and answer box. But if you do have any questions, either about the courses um, or about anything that was discussed um, in, in the panel session today, please do feel free to, to put um, those questions in the chat box. Uh, we are gonna go through some of the questions now, and I might actually ask if the speakers could please uh, put their videos back on so that we can have the opportunity to, to see, um, and I'll, direct some questions to the panelists as, as we go through. So uh, the first question is actually for, for Alan. Um, so uh, the question is, is they would, this person would like to know if they could become a police officer with this particular degree. Right, um, well actually the, um, the short answer to that is not with this particular uh, group criminology degree um, <clears throat> because um, the, uh, the uh, the degree in policing is is a more specific one, but um, with the criminology degree, 
Um, there are very there are several roles in the police force that you can uh, apply for. For example, crime scene um, investigator. Um, the the the, uh, the type of uh, information that we've been talking about, or a crime analyst. They're not actually sworn police officers, but they do have a specific role in the police service or the police force. Um, so those are just two examples, but there are a number of other roles which uh, people with a criminology degree could um, be employed by a police force. Great, excellent. Uh, and from the uh, forensic science perspective, it's a, it's a similar uh, answer in that it can provide you with the um, general background, but um, the requirement for policing is, is uh, something that they do um, separate to a university course. Um, all right, so the next question uh, is, what are the courses that are available in criminology and forensic science? So I, I, I might answer this one. Um, so there is the Bachelor of Criminology, uh, and within the Bachelor of Criminology, uh, you can have the option of, of a few majors. Um, so that's the major in digital security or analytics and research. Um, but you can also uh, do a double degree with the Bachelor of Criminology and a Bachelor of Forensic Science. And uh, this is actually one of, uh, it's an incredibly unique course. Um, it is only offered uh, at UTS and it really, um, leverages off the um, excellent criminology program that we have on offer as well as um, the foundations of forensic science that we've been building over um, 25 years. We were the first uh, forensic science course in Australia and it's a really good combination um, of options there. Um, you can also do the Bachelor of Criminology and International Studies which would allow um, students to have a year or a semester overseas. Um, if anybody is interested in uh, a forensic science course, we do offer just the regular Bachelor of Forensic Science, uh, but there are four majors in that course, which are chemistry, biology, uh, digital forensic science, and crime scene investigation. Uh, you can also combine that with international studies or also uh, a Bachelor of Law. So all of the course information and course structure is available on our website uh, and you can always check and see what the courses uh, are there. Okay, we've got a few questions here. Um, can you do an internship as part of uh, this program? So, um, Alan, do you mind answering this question? Right, um, yes, it's, it's a good question, uh, but there, there are specific issues and problems in relation to um, people doing internships with um, in a police organization. Um, you can imagine that there's a lot of um, very sensitive information um, that the police gain as a result of interactions with individuals in the community. And um, so um, the answer to this, the short answer to the question is no, they don't do internships. Um, uh, but, um, you know, that they there, there are sort of there are some uh, um, opportunities to work with the police and um, look at how they uh, how they operate but they <clears throat> they're very carefully um, screened and very carefully chosen um, so it wouldn't be like a normal internship that you would envisage like a term of where you get a uh, a sort of a, a, a job, a job in an organisation and work on it for however long the internship for is, you know, so a year or whatever. It's not like that. You can't do that with policing because um, it's dealing with so many uh, particular problems and, and risks and danger, as we know. So, um, so the answer, the short answer is no, I'm afraid. Uh, just to, to add um, from a forensic science perspective as well. Um, so internships are a really big part of um, the university's mission. Um, and as Alan has pointed out, it is a little bit more challenging when we are dealing with um, policing uh, careers in that those opportunities may not be as plentiful as they are in other um, areas. Uh, however, um, there are always opportunities to uh, engage with the academics and do internships on campus with our 
uh, our researchers in particular areas. Um, so while you may not be doing an internship in the police force, you will, you will still have an opportunity uh, to do an internship in the area of study, whether that's in criminology um, or forensic science. So uh, we do understand that that is an incredible part of a, a student's experience, and we do want to make that happen. It's just a little bit more challenging uh, for the criminology and forensic science uh, area. Um, I might ask a question about the careers that can come from this particular degree. Um, so, Claude, do you mind giving us some um, ideas or some examples of um, the potential careers that the forensic science could bring? And then I'll throw to Alan for the criminology side. Yeah, thank, thanks. Thanks, Scott. Um, Look, uh, forensic science, as um, Alan mentioned, um, you know, they, they, they are some um, functions within police forces um, which um, require highly technical and scientific skills. So typically crime scene is, is one of them. So we've got a very long, long history of uh, placing graduates, forensic science graduates, with police forces around Australia and even overseas. Um, through different pathways. Um, it's, there is not one single answer in terms of which way you go about it, because it depends on the jurisdiction and on the country. Uh, some jurisdictions have people in crime scene who are you know, full civilians and can go straight after um, your degree, like, like this one, uh, or straight forensic science degree. In some jurisdiction, you have to, uh, to do a, a fast-tracked uh, police uh, academy type of training uh, after the degree. Then you have the all the, the jobs that are in, uh, I would say, traditional forensic science laboratories. So the laboratories where they do things like DNA analysis and drugs and toxicology, and quite often there are um, some kind of um, uh, government um, laboratories, or it can be within a police force, but they are full scientists, like Victoria, for example, their, their forensic science laboratory is within the police. The same thing for AFP, uh, New South Wales Police, uh, it's different. There is another laboratory uh, under the New South Wales government doing these sort of analysis. Um, then you've got all the different types of analytical laboratories, whether we talk about regulatory laboratories, you know, racing, doping and so on, uh, which um, you know, employ a lot of our graduates. Um, and you've got uh, a lot of private businesses, uh, especially, um, especially, you know, consultancy firms. Uh, and I, I must say now with the kind of big digital transformation we are going through, um, you know, digital forensic science is going to be a big one. It's kind of the new DNA. And um, there are a lot of big, big firms, consultancy or financial companies, financial firms uh, who are doing a lot of internal investigation or, or private types of investigation. And they use a lot of um, our graduates or, and potentially future graduates of, of that double degree. Um, one thing I'd like just to add very briefly, and I just mentioned that before, but in passing, um, society is changing very quickly so we have to be very agile so our graduates have to be very agile and and with a degree and especially the double degree uh, that is on offer here um, it's a it's a great way really to be prepared as I mentioned for jobs that do not exist yet but are just around the corner and uh, it's the kind of experience we've seen overseas where they in places where they had a you know, very similar type of, of double degrees. And all of a sudden, uh, there is a, you know, a new, new crowd of people developing a new, type, new types of jobs. And uh, they are just there at the right time, um, at the right place. Great. Thank you, Claude. Uh, Alan, do you mind answering some career questions for the criminology side? Right. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Scott. Um, well, I sort of touched on this before in the in answer to the previous question. As I say, the criminology uh, degree, the Bachelor of Criminology, <clears throat> won't um, actually get you directly into a police force as a police officer, because you'll have to do some more work and some more study. The reason for that is um, police officers need to know detail around criminal law. They need to know uh, what powers police officers have, powers of arrest, search, seizure, uh, very detailed information. And so therefore, um, you, you know, you couldn't be accepted straight into the police force um, uh, without that, that extra study. 
So um, what can you do in the police force? Well, um, we mentioned, I think Marie mentioned and I mentioned intelligence led policing and the police, the police forces are always looking for br very bright people to help them on that intelligence side of policing. So we're looking for people who are intelligence analysts, crime analysts, we're looking for, um, as, as Claude was mentioning, um, crime scene investigators, but we're also looking at um, general management of policing. So for example, in New South Wales Police Force, there are about 16,000 sworn police officers. So those are police officers and detectives working on uh, in, in, in various different uh, local area commands around New South Wales. But also they're backed up by a lot of um, support personnel, probably about five to 6,000 support personnel. And those are, are people who are working in offices, let's say, all around the, the state. And they're supporting the police officers in management or supply roles or they're helping them to um, do the licensing function. So, for example, um, uh, firearms licensing um, and all sorts of different licensing that is administered by the New South Wales Police Force. But they're not that's not done by directly by sworn police officers. Um, they are, um, if you like, civilian um, uh, support workers. So there's there's lots of there's lots of uh, opportunities, and as I say, um, uh, the the changes that I've taught I've mentioned in my um, eight minutes, um, we the the police police forces are looking for very bright people throughout their organisation, not just uh, sworn police officers. Great, excellent. Um, I might there are some questions still uh, in in the in the chat. I might. We might finish on one question and then if your question was not answered in today's session um, we will uh, do our best to follow up um, with you to, to answer that question or if you do have any questions after the, the session today you can always send an email to fast.international at uts.edu.au so uh, the question um, is around what kind of student assignments um, would there be um, i can just sort of speak to the general philosophy um, at UTS is that um, the, the, the types of assessments that we uh, have for our students are all about allowing students to demonstrate their skills, their knowledge, their understanding in a whole range of different areas. We understand that um, maybe traditionally exams um, and essays have been how people have had assessments in the past, um, but we understand that when you move out into the real world, that's not necessarily how um, you are going to be uh, judged on your performance. So um, definitely from the sort of science side, we're very much focused on um, practical skills and practical hands-on learning. So some examples of assignments from that side of um, the, the, the degree would be things around um, practical experiences like in our crime scene courses, uh, you'll have the opportunity to, to analyze a mock crime scene like you would if you were in um, you know, an actual crime scene investigator. Um, we have things like scientific reports or scientific presentations where you might um, have to talk to um, some experiments that you've performed and explain what you've done and the results that you've found. Um, from the criminology side, it, it might be more around um, policy documents, um, you know, performing some level of research or, or literature um, for the particular problem that is part trying to be addressed um, as part of um, the, the particular subject or area that you're studying. Um, and oral presentations, uh, group work, team um, based assessments are also very core to um, the different types of assessments that students have. So we do acknowledge that exams uh, may have been a part of your life prior to coming to UTS and it, and it will certainly be, um, but it's about giving you a more holistic assessment of your understanding in a course and in a particular area. So um, you will experience a whole range of different areas um, coming to UTS. Um, so I'm gonna, we are at the, at the end of, of today's session. So I would just like to thank our, our three speakers, uh, Professor Claude Rue, Dr. Alan Beckley and Dr. Marie Moralata. 
Um, if you do have any other questions, as I said, you can email fas.international at uts.edu.au. There is also um, a FAS specific um, page that you can visit. If we just want to pop over to the next slide, we can find out what life is like in the FAS lane or just briefly there, that's a, a quick rundown of, of the different course uh, and the structure uh, there. So that's, uh, again, we'll make these slides available to you so you can see um, all of the information that was presented in today's session. Um, and you can always visit our website to find out more specific uh, information. So uh, thank you all for coming uh, and we hope to see you at UTS very soon.